let's take for an example the recent article in P1 where the fire op where the fire uh, personnel, firefighter, and EMTs have been shot. Put yourself in a, for a moment in the position of, of the officer that's now responding to that call. What are the skills, what do you think is taking place that that officer needs to manage while they're responding to this scene? Well, I'm sure there's a multitude of skills and things that are going through his head, and responding to the radio call. Well, let's start with the radio to begin with. Can you imagine what that radio call sounds like to the officer at that time? Because somebody on the air is saying, firefighters have been shot, EMTs have been shot, respond to that scene. Suspect is, is armed and moving from, 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 inner, from place to place. So there's a lot going through that person. We talk about de-escalation. This is where de-escalation starts right now, in that officer's mind. This is a human interaction scenario. It's here to reduce liability. It's here to manage everything that takes place to get safely from point A to point B. So the officer has to accept the radio call, has to interpret the radio call, now transfer all of that into their, into their skills of managing the gas pedal, checking the intersections, clearing left and right, because you have to, you have to get to the scene safely, right? Or you haven't helped anybody. And, and, and I'm sure that, you know, the adrenaline is flowing, so judgment is maybe compromised. For most of us, it is. And, and simulators have always been described as judgment and decision-making tools, because that's what they are. Here, the officer can practice their judgment under this situation. It's a safe environment, because we're in a simulator, but we've, we've created this environment we can put radio calls in here that are, that are the customer's actual radio dispatch. They can use their dispatchers and play it, play it in the simulator. It's very difficult to do that on a track. And again, we're not trying to replace track. Track has its place. But, but the, this type of training, this de-escalation training, this, this, this liability reduction takes place on the simulator just like in flight, just like in trucking, just like in these, all these other similar applications. So now the officer is responding to the, speed, to the scene. What's their speed? Who's monitoring their speed? Who's monitoring their location, the update on the radio? Are they listening to the radio? Is there audible exclusion taking place in driving response, just like in a shooting situation? And we all know, yes, of course it is. But where else do you practice that? How do we get to that point? It's in the simulator. Yes, and it's not just the driving that's part of this exercise. It, it's from the time they take the call to the time they get on scene and dealing with the scene as well. So how do we broaden that experience? Well, in, in, in within the simulator, since we can break out all of the different skills required and create this scenario, because remember, according to that P1 article, we're not even at the scene yet where the, car, where the suspect crashes into the officer and now there's a uh, firefight taking place. So we, we have, that situation, when we get to that situation, now it's even greater and it's even uh, a more advanced training, right? Because now the judgment and decision making and the de-escalation is, 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 is right there at the scene. How do you de-escalate that scene? Well, you need to be controlled. You control your breathing and be under control in that situation, just like in driving. We have to have those, everything that applies, all the tactics, everything that applies to a dead, deadly force situation, when you, where you use a use of force simulator applies when you're driving because really it's the same it's the same principles it's the same practice so what we do is we put together the two simulators we put a force option simulator mile range with our driving simulator fact driving simulator le 1000 and we combine them together so now the officer pulls up to this scene we have a vehicle actually come in and crash into the simulator the officer steps out of the vehicle if that's their choice and that's their response and then steps over to the, to the Milo screen, the human interacting scenario there, they see the suspect, they see the situation, and now they're reacting back and forth. So it's a transfer of those skills. You're transferring from the driving side into now dealing with it's the- It's a transfer, it's a reinforcement. And here's, here is the greatest power of that simulation, of all simulation. It's not while the officer is driving in the vehicle or standing up at the screen in, in, a, in a force option situation. But the power of simulation training is in the debrief, the debriefing. It's after I'm done with the scenario and after I'm done with the situation, I've survived it, I've gone through it. Depending on the officer, my heart rate may be up, it may not be up. But we have, we have you know, tech, technology today can monitor all of this. We can show all of this. Now the officer gets to step back, they get to review it in the debrief, and they get to see themselves as they reacted. 
but it's also good for administration as well, right? Yeah, I was going to ask you about that because obviously, you know, people, even instructors have different skill levels. Is there a way of leveling that playing field for them? So what happens, a consistency to in that my thing? experience over 30 years, what happens with us is that in, in, instructors are, are, are great, but there's, there's a difference of instruction when you get to a simulation level. When you, when you train on a simulator, you do not want to take it back to lecture. If your instructor is talking more than your students is talking when you're doing a simulation training, then your instructor is doing what we call instructor-based, instructor-focused training rather than student-based or student-focused training. The student should be talking more than the instructor and the instructor should only be asking questions. But there's another aspect of that training. The instructor should be reinforcing your policies and procedures, your state law, your federal law, not their own personal preferences. And what happens is they get into a situation like this and it's the old locker room instructor comes out and says, look, if, if a car rams you like this, I know policy says we can't, whatever it is, shoot from a moving vehicle or shoot from within our vehicle, but I'm telling you, kid, you need to do this. Oh, okay, I get it, but, but that doesn't fall into place today with the contemporary law enforcement and the, and, the, and the change that is taking place in law enforcement, right? They want, uh, our communities want a different response. So how do we maintain that response? How do we, how do, we do that? One way is, is what FAC, what we call vitals. And what vitals does is when, you, when, the, when a student drives a, a, sim, a, situate, a scenario, as they drive the scenario, these categories are all captured. And you probably can't see this, but you can see the green, red, and yellow. So basically green is great, you're doing well. Yellow is you're close. That's predictive behavior. Remember we talked about that. They talk about it within an interaction with individuals, but it also applies, in my opinion, to driving. Predictive behavior in driving tells me that I'm pushing the envelope, I'm on the edge as I'm your driving. Close calls. I, those, those are your close calls that we normally don't, don't capture, but here we can. And then there's this one, it's red and that's unacceptable, whatever that category is. But these categories are not decided or determined by the individual instructor on that day, because sometimes by three o'clock in the afternoon, I'm kind of done and I want to rush through and leave. But what this does is this creates a, a category and a standard that the instructors need to follow. So that red, we have to address that. We have to reach up and figure out what happened with the red. I need to remediate. I need to find out whether or not it was the student's uh, mistake or a system uh, error or something like that. And then I, I need to address it, remediate. I can also look at the yellow and say, look, do you realize you're pushing the envelope here? You're right on the edge. You're, you're pushing this. This is what I was talking about when I said, you show me an officer and how they drive through their community, and I'll show you an officer's attitude towards that community. Because if they're not driving with respect and dignity for all persons, that's what we really need to do, right? I mean, the situations that are on the news today, when you see just the video of the physical, the human interaction, is what? Respect and dignity. That's what we, how we need to treat people. Fair and impartial, respect and dignity. Same thing with the driving, because driving is a reflection of us. If I'm tailgating somebody trying to make them move, what am I really doing? I'm using force. You are. I'm using force. Aggressive. I'm, I'm, force. I'm being aggressive. I'm being overly assertive and I'm trying to, that's force. It starts with driving. But with the continuum of training, we're able to put those two together and guess what? Then it comes out because a student can see themselves as they are. An instructor can look back and evaluate. We have a picture in picture screen. So if you said, no, I cleared that intersection, we can say, well, let's look and see if you cleared it or not. And that's how, we, that's how the continuum of training, that's how we tie these different simulators together to get to a higher level of training. There's another aspect of this too that I wanna bring out. In pursuit training, when we're driving in pursuit, most all agencies, probably every agency in the country now, has a written policy that pursuits are governed by this. There's, there's basically three different policies. There's, a, there's a, a threshold policy and there's a zero policy and there's a you make the judgment officer policy. That's basically the three categories. There's another component that's called a supervisor. And the supervisor is supposed to be monitoring that pursuit. Right. Now you tell me, where do you train a supervisor to monitor pursuits and to practice what they're hearing because- Relating to what's going on. In to the what's action. really taking place, place. right? Well, once again, in the simulator, I can do this. I can take a supervisor, I can put them on the, on the, behind the simulator so they can't see the screen. 
I put a student into it. I let them talk to each other on the radios. And the student is saying, calling out speeds, calling out that. Because we know when, it, when an officer wants to maintain, keep in the pursuit, and they call a speed, when do you call that speed? When you're at the slowest speed that you're going, right? Because then the supervisor goes, well, he only said 50 miles an hour. She only said 60 miles an hour. So I thought it was safe, so I let it continue. But in fact, we know what's taking place is different. So with the continuum of training, I've tied these two together. When I get to the scene, who manages the initial scene when, when they first arrive? The officer that's arrived first. Officer first, right? So that they are now in command of that scene, right? Well, then the supervisor rolls in and now the supervisor takes command. So how do I tie that in to an actual scenario and scene? Same way I do with the, with the Milo, with the force option simulator, only this time we use a command simulator. It's called in command. And now the sergeant, the officer, the supervisor, whoever that is, lieutenant, sergeant, whatever rank you have, can now roll up to a scene and begin calling on the radio, giving directions, giving calls, making judgments, making, making uh, decisions that affect that scene while the officers are still interacting with the Milo, with the suspects and with the situations because we know the scenes don't just stop when we get there. Sure. There's so much more to the scene. It continues, doesn't it? it just continues. And there's a whole more people involved and more skill sets that need that. I.e. that's the, the continuum of training. And one other aspect that, that the continuum of training brings out is that uh, it's, it's a true skill of the officer. So for example, I can be like, for, I've been at, at shows and I've had entire SWAT teams come by and we show them the, say, hey, would you like to step in and show us what you can do? And they go, I'm good, I'm good. One of the defenses of driver's training in the simulator because officers don't like to be put up on stage and, and, and judged exposed. and exposed in front of their peers and in front of supervisors and their skills may not be quite as sharp as they think they are in their heads, right? Um, and so, so when they get into the simulator, one of the excuses they'll use is, well, if it was real, I would have done differently. I would have done it correctly. And if it was real, I would have done this, or it just doesn't feel like the real car. And, um, you know, this thing makes me all woozy and I can't drive it and it makes me sick. And so I'm not just going to drive it anymore. Well, these are common defenses, right? But again, we go back to the beginning, flight, military, trucking, driving, heavy equipment operation, all of those simulation is of such great value and is of such great value to first responders but for some reason that hurdle we don't quite get past it right when we're when we're training on this the other benefit of this that i forgot to mention is do you know who sets these standards for the speed the speed threshold the the the, the intersection it's the depart it's the own individual departments you customize this to your policies and your procedures it's not your instructor or their preferences. It, it's not the, our, uh, the company, FAC Incorporated, saying this is how you should train. We can give you curriculum, we have curriculum, yeah. but that's not, the, that's not the, the, the real bottom line is you want your policies and your procedures in here which are guiding your instructors and your students through this training to get what that benefits what they can out of the training. Yeah. So you can map your policy into this program, into this program. Yes, program. into your, whatever your policy is. So for example, intersection, clearing. Some departments have you must stop and then proceed. Some departments have you must proceed with what they call due regard, right? With, with certain caution through the intersection. And, and some actually have a policy where it's, it's you just make your own, your own decision as you go through it. So whatever your policy is, you can incorporate it into this intersection. Speed threshold, some departments say 10 miles an hour over. This zone right here, you see a 30 mile an hour uh, uh, street sign there, a speed limit on that. So you say 40 miles an hour, up to 40 is yellow, over 40 is red or, or green or whatever, however you set it up, you put these in here. So now all of your people are driving on your policies. The radio interaction is on your radio terminology and your radio um, uh, broadcasting with, with your people. So they, it puts them into character. And when you, if you're an instructor, my role is to take the student, get them into the best character that I can, because that's when their real skills will be brought out.